delighted to welcome back Nancy Doyle. Sorry, that's Dr. Nancy Doyle, psych psychologist, um, superstar of uh, Employable Me and soon to be the Employables. So um, welcome, Nancy. You've uh, got some other news to tell us about, I'm sure, as well. But congratulations on your PhD. Well deserved, I'm sure. And uh, something that I will never do because um, the pain barrier is too too great, I think. The pain barrier so, was so, fairly great. Yeah. yeah, where's your floppy hat? We want ah, to see the floppy well, hat. You have, yeah, I, I have photographic evidence of the floppy hat. You'll have to contend with that. It okay. is on social media. If you, if you use to search for it, you can find it. We'll find That's the floppy hat. That's very cool, though. Congratulations. That's a big Thank you. So, so, so yeah, you're a bit of a, a regular here, um, but uh, there's a couple of things you, you know, you've got some fairly big news. So, um, do you want to tell us what you've been up to since we yeah. last chatted? Well, you know, mainly finishing my PhD. Um, that did take an enormous <laughs> amount of my um, of my energy, and, it, and it's not an irrelevant thing. So, uh, the, the topic of my PhD was the um, a critical realist analysis of interventions to support people with hidden disability in the workplace. Yeah. And um, so, as you know, that's my my background. My background is, has always been working with hidden disability in the workplace. And one of the things that uh, I was very interested in from a research perspective is that we don't have any evidence um, on what works and what doesn't work. You know, there, there isn't a big uh, research field out there evaluating what businesses are doing to uh, be inclusive and uh, what individuals um, are experiencing and, and what are the what are the psychological bases for improvement in this area and so specifically I looked at coaching um, so as you know I run uh, Genius Within which is a social enterprise that specializes in coaching and training interventions for people with um, hidden disability and neurodiverse conditions and and I was very interested to know you know what was actually happening psychologically as people went through that coaching experience because all of the legislation says that organizations have to accommodate not individuals so if we're doing coaching interventions are we changing the individuals to fit their environment is that legally and ethically and morally okay you know what's happening um, and so, you know, as part of that, what I did was a, a real critique of the field because uh, a lot of the conditions that we that we call hidden disability in, in legislation, that's not how people refer to themselves. They refer to themselves as neurodiverse or neurodivergent or neurodifferent. Um, and there's a big social movement, a social model of disability movement to really say that actually these conditions aren't uh, the, the same as a physical disability that the only reason that these conditions are protected by disability law um, is because the world that we live in is not a conducive environment to certain types of thinking and uh, the neurodiversity movement is about embracing differences in people's neurocognitive profile so understanding that not everybody is a generalist uh, some people are really really good at, at visual um, perception really really good at spatial reasoning working out how things fit uh, those particular talents don't always lend themselves to uh, to school work and so people can leave school feeling that they don't have any talent to bring to the workplace and they would be wrong um, but they're also likely to get a diagnosis of something and that diagnosis is very medically based it's very uh, based on what people can't do as opposed to what they can do uh, and so my, my whole career has been about finding out you know, what people can do and, and, and how people how specialist thinkers can can have a place um, in our society and and have value in a workplace and, and what that looks like and how do we make sure that that organizations do their do their duty and create inclusive environments and one of the things that I found out in my PhD is that people going through a coaching intervention really that coaching intervention is like an extended mediation process so um, we're not really changing how people think uh, what we're doing in that co coaching intervention is changing their ability to articulate what they need t changing their ability to, to self-advocate for flexibility in the tools that they use at work the schedule that they have at work the environment of their workplace um, being able to ask for things like uh, noise barriers or flex time or working from home day 
days, um, adopting the use of assistive technology um, and being able to ask for that congruently, being able to build it into their rhythm of work and, and, and adopting all of these inclusive processes. So it's really kind of undoing some of the harm that was done in that medicalized process by, by where you know they their experience was to be told that they are in some way having a deficit, that there's something broken, that they're that they're not normal. Um, and and you know the the issues that that creates for self-esteem, we are actually shifting that in a coaching process and bringing some of that self-esteem back, having people be aware of what they're good at, and therefore feeling more confident to talk to their employers and talk about the things that they need to work at their best, which I think is a great intervention um, and, and is, is not morally questionable. <laughs> uh, but it does leave employers in a better position as well of, of knowing how to be inclusive. That's a, 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 a great summary, and um, I know that Antonio's got a question, so uh, I'll hand straight over. Well, uh, you end up touching one of the areas that end up going directly to uh, human resources and how they uh, hire people. So we know how stressful is the life of people working on, on HR uh, sometimes. Uh, and sometimes they don't really, learning and development is something that sometimes HR professionals do in terms of helping others, but is not something that they do themselves in order to improve their skills. So how do you uh, think that HR professionals can uh, be better at their job and be better at being more inclusive in their hiring practices? Uh, what are you proposing for them? Um, well, we do a lot of training with HR professionals and a lot of training with occupational health physicians. Um, right now, I'm talking to you from the uh, conference um, in America, which is the Industrial and Organizational Psychology Conference, um, which is all about designing HR processes, designing recruitment and selection techniques, understanding talent. And this is a developing narrative in that field. Um, I think activists and stakeholders are 20 years ahead of the systems and processes that we have. Uh, the, the narrative around um, conditions such as autism, ADHD, dyslexia, dyspraxia, Tourette's syndrome, and, and also um, you know, mild to moderate mental health needs, which are just as prevalent in the human population and so in some ways we can actually we should really be considering them normal um, you know how how do we make how do we make those those things inclusive and, and there are lots of ways that we can do that the, the reasonable adjustments the accommodations that people can make to the process to, to what they're expecting to find as well you know a lot of our processes are about looking for for, for flat kind of jack of all trades people that are uh, at a certain level of everything as opposed to seeking out people people that have mastery in some areas uh, and, and, are, and are weaker in others. And, and, you know, I think people are starting to listen. I think, um, you know, we're using the, the language is changing. And that's one of the big things that I want to talk about today is, is how the language is changing. So I've started this talking about hidden disability because from a legal perspective, that's what we're talking about. But that isn't the narrative that we're starting to hear. So the activists and campaigners and stakeholders have been using the language of neurodiversity for nearly 20 years now. Um, and the HR world is starting to get it. Um, you know, there are articles in, in Forbes, articles in um, the Harvard Business Review, there are uh, guides to neurodiversity published by uh, the CIPD in England, which is the Chartered Institute of Personnel Development. And, you know, the, there are there are um, ways in which this narrative is starting to be understood in the human resources community. But I think what the human resources community and certainly the industrial and organizational psychology community need is evidence. So it's, it's all very well developing awareness. But if we want to move to acceptance and inclusion, we need to know practically what works. And, and that's one of the reasons that I did my PhD, because it, there is no evidence on that. The evidence is, is, is really kind of thin and, and between. I did write a, a, a report for the British Psychological Society, which is published in 2017, which was a kind of summary of the evidence so far, uh, looking not just at academic research, but also at uh, practice and what was working in practice and what we could, people were doing in practice to actually be inclusive. And, and that's things like, 
allowing schedule flexibility. It's things like understanding that loud, noisy environments are not conducive to cognitive functions and that people who have um, uh, lower ability in terms of concentration and attention um, are going to find those environments compromise their ability to work at their best. So, so there are there are bits and pieces that are coming out, but what we need to do is keep building, keep building the research evidence, look at longitudinal analysis. You know, if we put in place these systems, do we retain people? Do people uh, get promoted? Do they perform better? You know, th these are these are the metrics that, that that HR people are interested in, and we need to start doing the research that will convince them that these policies and practices are you know beneficial to what they're trying to do. There are plenty of HR events in the United States uh, where HR practitioners go and, and attend. Some of them are organized by organizations like SAP Success Factors, others by HR Tech. I actually is an industry that, that I regularly track and, and I follow all series of events. And this is actually a topic that we very rarely observe to be discussed over there. So we might have psychologists talking about this between themselves, but then the HR practitioners, the ones that are in the field post posting the jobs, they are completely absent of the discussion. So how can we change this? I, I think it is changing. I think that's a pessimistic view, Antonio. <laughs> I think the the difference. I mean, I've worked in this this field for twenty years, um, and that one of the big differences that I'm noticing is that people know what the word neurodiversity means now. They've heard it before. They understand that um, that people with the conditions that I've mentioned um, have a a place at the table in in employment. They don't know how yet, but they are aware. And I think you know, going to those conferences and and talking to HR professionals, you have to go with something. You can't just go and say, hey, you need to be aware of this. You need to say, hey, you need to be aware of this, and this is how it affects your practice. So you know, it, it's we can't put the cart before the horse. We have to we have to understand. Um, you know what's going to work and then we can take it to to practitioners and and hr professionals are only one part of the puzzle what what the other thing that's happening is in in leadership people are very aware of uh the, the talent advantage of uh neuro differences and and that's going to drive uh, an, an uplift in in human resources people taking this more seriously but actually we also need to look at middle management and uh, and senior management practices because it's all very well saying you need to hire more people with with, with these differences, um, but we need those people. We need the people that are going to be supervising them to understand that that isn't necessarily a bad thing, and that doesn't mean that they're going to get someone who's just going to be really awkward that they're going to struggle to manage. They, you know, we need to, we need to, we need evidence. End of. And until that evidence is there, um, you know, it's going to be harder to get this message across. But certainly, the awareness I think is happening. And yeah, ten years ago, nobody had heard the word uh, neurodiversity. People thought that dyslexia was something that only affected you at school. They had no idea that it was a workplace issue as well. Um, and now we have more and more communication and conversations about that. And I think that's a positive thing. And I would also say that our big HR organization, Antonio, did not uh, comment on, but it is SHRM. It is our Society of Human Resources Management. That's the really big one, and we are actually talking about neurodiversity there. They still have a ton of work to do, and I agree with you. We need the evidence. And a, a problem that we have in the States, and it's not just in the States, but we definitely have it here in the States, is disclosure. Because mm. as you talk about all this stuff, Nancy, all of the things that you mention are good for all employees. And so many Americans mm -hmm. are not going to want to come out and identify as being neurodiverse because we are nervous and we have reasons to be that we will be we will be excluded. I remember I've talked multiple times about you know, my in my brain happens to um, sometimes struggle with depression and ADHD and anxiety. All of those things, of course, are related. And I I talk about them openly, and I have so many people come back to me and say, I'm really surprised you would admit that, Deborah. Wow, I mean, you're a leader and you're admitting that. So 
there is a lot more work happening in the United States than some people realize. And mm -hmm. there is a lot of disruption happening in the United States as well. And there's a lot. And what I've done with my work is I'm actually moving more, uh, more of my conversations into the mainstream conversations because we've been – um, and we're not the only ones, the United States is, is not the only one that's guilty of this, other countries as well. But just looking at from the U.S. lens, um, the, you know, we have, we've cut people up and diced them into all these little diverse groups so that there's nobody that isn't a protected class unless you're, say, my son, who is a white male 30 years old. And so mm -hmm. my husband now, he has a disability and he's 66, so he's protected. So everybody's protected. So when we're having these conversations, especially from the perspective of future of the work and the gig economy and everything that's happening, um, we have to look at how do we make sure we uh, that, that we make sure that everyone can be their best self at work. So all these mm. tips and things that you, Dr. Doyle, are recommending are best practices across the workforce, especially when Americans are not going to disclose. We are not going to mm. self-identify, and we are not going to disclose because just the disruptive way that we run our country with the litigation, the legislation, the discrimination. And a lot of people like to you know, slam the um, the United States, and I get it. I know that we have a lot of things to make fun of these days, but there's actually some really powerful work that's starting to happen, and they're happening in very wow. powerful ways with leaders that are going to change yep. all of these. And so we're glad you're in the conversation. So I'll turn it over to you, and I think Antonio and Neil both want to comment on that too. So you go. So, so I, I I agree with you, Deborah, and I think uh, there's some very exciting things happen in in the in the USA. So um, I have this little slide that I use um, when I'm doing talks, and it's it's about levels of inclusion. And there's a kind of level where people are excluded, and and we know this is the case. You know, only 10% of people with autism in the US have a job, 15% in the UK, um, around somewhere between 25 and 50% of the prison population have ADD. Um, you know, 71% of the prison population are are, are unable to read. We know that exclusion is, is currently what's happening. But in the UK, we have something called compliance inclusion, which is where people include because they have to by law. And because the human resources laws are much tighter in the UK, um, disclosure, uh, provided you already have the job, disclosure will get you help. And that's, uh, you know, that, that, that mechanism is well entrenched. Um, and in the U.S., that mechanism isn't very well entrenched. But in the U.S., one of the things that's happening is deliberate inclusion. So because people have developed a narrative of talent advantage, we have lots and lots of anecdotal evidence now that companies are deliberately seeking people with neuro differences because they know they bring specialist skills. Now, it's a little bit stereotyped around autism and the IT industry at the moment, but you got to start somewhere. And, you know, there are lots of other things that people with autism can do. And there are lots of reasons why people with ADD or dyspraxia or Tourette's may be also incredibly strong, uh, talented, specialist people. But, you know, they, this idea of deliberate inclusion is it's kind of like the, the carrot to the compliance inclusions, inclusions stick. So we have these two different approaches. One is a stick approach. One is a carrot approach. And a combination of both of them is going to get us to a more systemically inclusive place where it's just the way things are done around here. And when it's just the way things are done around here, uh, disclosure isn't going to be something that you have to worry about because you're not actually being. So w I do uh, a lot of disability confidence stuff in the UK. And one of the recommendations that I make from my company, which is a disability confident leader, is don't ask for disclosure. It's pointless. The label is irrelevant. What you need to ask is how do I support you to work at your best? And when you ask that question, to show that you're genuine, give examples of things you've done before. So here's some accommodations we've made before to people's jobs. Here's some accommodations we've made before to the recruitment process. Would any of these work for you? Is there anything else that you need that we can support you with to work at your best? And, and having that narrative flipped from, you know, what is your medical diagnosis and therefore what do I have to do by law to uh, what are your strengths and advantages and what can I do to support you to work at your best? That's the narrative that we that we should be talking about. Um, 
And that's why, you know, I, I think we're in a transition point. We're in a paradigm shift. And there are people who are way ahead of the game and there are people who aren't even talking about this. But, you know, where we're at in this paradigm shift and, and the changing language and the interpretation and the, the we're really hearing stakeholder voice in this discussion now as well. Um, and, and that's what I want to talk about right now. So Neil, I can see and you I, have a question. Right. And I just want to make one other quick comment, and then I promise I'm going to turn it over to Neil. But another thing that we're seeing with the future of work conversations is we want to put this in the hands of the person, of the employee, instead of making them go to HR. So if you have all these tools available, if I hurt my back that I can take my desk and I can stand it up, I don't have to go to HR. And the more we do that, the more it also takes away from the disclosure and just makes yes. it part of bring our entire self yes. to work all the time. So Neil, yes. I'm turning it to you. And then of course he's speaking to himself, so I'll keep talking. So no, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, come on, Neil, Mike fail. Yes, working this time. So I think there's some fundamental things that we need to do that go beyond just the, the enablement model and the empowerment stuff, which we're starting to see in organizations, it's stuff that we're trying to do within my own organization, but there's this whole um, change in how we design jobs and design work, um, because what we've done over the last century or so is to push everyone's career paths into management. Um, mm. You know, you're really good at something, mm. become a manager and start doing something mm. that you're crap at um, and mm. that you really hate. So, so we need to find ways of rewarding people and giving people uh, chances to progress in their careers that don't involve an Excel spreadsheet or managing people or you know supervisory roles. Now, some some you know some people who are neurodiverse may actually enjoy the supervision and enjoy the people side of things, but a lot of people don't. And and I think that then when you were talking about giving people stuff to do that they're good at, what we've done is we've flattened everybody's career profiles by mm -hmm. asking for everyone to be generalist. And, and, and so we, we really need to rethink how we're designing people's jobs and our organizational structures, because we used to have people that did specialist functions, and we've kind of taken them away, and we've expected people to, oh, here, here, here's an app for that. You know, you go and figure that out and, and, and do all your admin work. And what we've turned uh, skilled people into is crap administrators um, rather than uh, allowing organizations and people within those organizations to flourish. So I think that, yes. that we need to change a lot of the way that we think about what it is people should be doing in their jobs. Um, Which is exactly and, why I'm at the uh, the IO <laughs> Psychology Conference yeah. today. Exactly yeah. that. No, I, I so, completely agree. So, 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 and that when people get that opportunity, then, then then they're maybe going to be happier talking about their experience and their strengths and their weaknesses and everything else. But it's you're right. Disclosure is something that that people don't. Disclose and disclosure is a dirty word, as has been said. People don't self-identify as being something um, and, unless there's something in it for them, or they don't publicly mm -hmm. self-identify. So, so one of the things I'm, I'm trying to get people to do is feel comfortable bringing that identity into the workplace, um, and and also getting those positive role models, like you say, it's it's great. You've got to demonstrate that you've got to have the the adjustments and stuff there. But what we really want to be doing is actually having the senior people in the organization saying, you know what, this is me too, and this is how it worked for me. Because it's those it's those senior role models that um, then allow the, the middle management, a, a, the sort of headspace to be able to say that this is okay for them to do, but also um, allow everyone else to feel comfortable that they can succeed. Because I, I, I'm going to pick up on something that you said, which was, you know, we want to make sure that the people that are supervising these uh, these, in, these neurodiverse individuals feel comfortable that they're not going to get someone that's going to be a burden. Well, actually, I think that that almost is put setting too low expectations, because actually, you know what, a lot of these people should be leading and not being supervised. Uh, and, and, uh, but and that but that's but you've got where to, you've, we're but at. you've got we to have, get them through exactly. that through yes. that uh, you know we've got to build that pipeline. Yeah. 
and a lot of those middle managers may be neurodiverse themselves. Absolutely. You know, so there's 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 lots of you know we're, we're really talking about 15 to 20 percent of the human population. So the I, I, when I talk to people about you know recruiting for neurodiversity, I'm like, what about the neurodiversity you already have? Because if you have a business with more than 100 people in it, you you already have people with these conditions in your workplace. You may just not know it. So there's um so there's 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 lots of this uh, uh, that's happening. And I think um so there's there's kind of two things that I want to talk about and and share with your um community community today and um, one of them is that the employable me program that I made in the UK um, in 2016 and 2017 is coming to the US it is going to air on the A&E channel at 10 p.m. Uh, on May the 8th for the first time and then it will go on and um, uh, do another eight series and I worked with uh, six of the contributors myself personally on this show um, uh, individuals with autism and Tourette syndrome um, and I'm delighted to tell you that we did the positive assessment we looked I looked for their strengths I talked to them about what they were good at they they developed career ideas which they have brought to fruition um, and so we'll be able to watch their stories um, on A&E uh, very soon and um, the other thing that I'm doing is um, I'm working with uh, a whole bunch of people in the UK to host a conference called uh, Celebrating Neurodiversity. So we're going to have an awards dinner on um, a Thursday, the 27th of June, and then on the 28th of June, which is a Friday, we're going to have a conference where we're going to be talking about um, we're going to be talking about the, the neurodiversity movement, celebrating how far we've come, celebrating the achievements that we have and the people who are achieving and who are who are being those role models, um, really, you know, honouring their their hard work and 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 their authenticity and their ability to make themselves vulnerable by putting it out there and, and doing what they do, um, but also talking about the language and the debate and, and and where is this movement going? You know, how are we talking? There's there's lots of different terminology that are flying around at the moment and it's evolving. And one of the things that's very hard for businesses is to catch up with the correct lingo. I mean, this is true in all social movements. You know, when we talk about ethnicity um, now we talk about ethnicity you know that's the word that we use we talk about people of color uh, we, you know the, the language changes when you have social inclusion movements um, and the language should be driven by the people that are part of that movement and by, by stakeholders however there's quite a lot of uh, disagreement within the, the field as to as to what language is appropriate and how people like to self-identify and and that's one of the things that we want to raise in the conversation and in the in the conference is is what what how do you like to be described how do you um, self-identity uh, identify so um, and, and make sure that stakeholders have a chance to, to contribute to that and I'm hoping that they'll be able to do that through the Twitter chat on um, on Tuesday I think one of one of the things uh, that we should uh, consider is looking at the concept of uh, customer journey and apply it to uh, and create something similar as employee journey, where employers uh, create an employer journey through their work at the company that could follow, let's say, their, uh, as they age, they will go to different steps. So if an organization is able to identify the employee journey, to map the employee journey, and to pay more attention to that, they might be in a better condition to follow the different stages where an individual can be at a certain phase of their life at the company. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and one of the things that um, that uh, Neil alluded to, which I think is important, is about the role of supervisors. So um, at Genius Within, uh, these days we see around two and a half thousand people a year for coaching interventions um, to support them with their neurodiversity in the workplace. And and I would say, I mean, this is, I don't have I don't have actual hard data on this, but from my experience, I would put a number on this at around around 50% of our clients are people who were brilliant at their jobs and got promoted into management. So they were excellent physiotherapists, they were um, amazing electricians, they were engineers, they were um, social workers, and actually their neurodiversity was what was making them good at their jobs. So, you know, a dyspraxic nurse who has huge ability in, in, in verbal reasoning skills uh, is able to do a huge amount of patient care, but then goes into management and now suddenly a lot of their job is about uh, organizing rotors and um, you know, systematizing processes which don't play to uh, dyspraxic 
uh, str uh, strengths. And so, you know, getting people over that hurdle in, you know, we want to include people with neurodiverse conditions in management because they add huge amounts of value in their expertise and what they know. But, you know, it, do we do we have to have them always take on those administrative roles as part of that leadership? Do we, uh, how do we buffer around those administrative demands as part of those that leadership? That's a big part of the question. Career paths, yeah, career paths are really important and understanding that there will be differences within the career path. So one of the things we do at Genius Within, for example, when we promote somebody, we do um, a workplace needs assessment again. If they already have one, um, we, we do it again because we understand that the role is different. So I have an employee with autism who has been promoted twice within the organization. She was promoted from um, a practitioner to a team manager, and now she's a department head. And, and every time she's had a promotion, we go through that. We go through this process again and we say, right, what, what accommodations do you need now? What do we need yes. to do to help you to work at your best now as your career progresses? Because we want you in a leadership role. We are a neurodiversity company. You have autism. It's an amazing thing that we're able to support you in your career but how do we make sure that we um, support you with that I think that's a, yeah, a really important point all of these kind of uh, all of the adjustments need to be revisited anyway even if someone's in the same role the technology around them is changing the job characteristics are changing we're in such a fast-paced environment but one of the things that, that uh, we're doing and a number of other companies are also doing now is is standing up um, parallel career paths so um, essentially we have an expert career path within our organization which doesn't require you to be a manager and the the seniority and and um the uh compensation is mapped to managerial levels uh, across mm -hmm. the organization so i think this is a really positive step forward because there are people then that that can actually do a job that they're going to be really good at and be recognized for that rather than then having to think well you know what I really quite like the same kind of access to a, a house a car and a good life that Joe has so I'm going to go into management because mm -hmm, doing mm -hmm. what I really love doesn't pay so, exactly so, so important so, so I think that's a really positive move, um, and I'm 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 excited to see more of that. But I also think that we need to be rethinking general general job design, as I said, because we mm -hmm. maybe AI will take away some of this stuff, maybe, but we'll see. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, I was thinking about this the other day. It's like I, I had to go into town, and I needed to do some basic admin things like pay congestion charge. And, and at the moment, it's still not there. I need to set myself a reminder. I can use Siri to, to remind me to do the thing. Mm. But it, what, it, what I, ideally I'd like is, hey, Siri, or hey, Cortana, or hey, Alexa, oh, Siri's just woken up, play my congestion charge. And um, it to do it, rather than just set a reminder. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. so, so so those are the kind of you know because those are the things you want to offload because you want to be doing the creative things so um, mm -hmm. I, I know that we've we've pretty much reached the end of our our time and you're rushing off to, to your next conference event so thank you very much for taking the time today um, we need to actually um, thank uh, Barclays and my Cleartex and also make an announcement um, to thank Microlink because we have a new uh, corporate supporter today and um, thank you very much to Dr. Nasser Siabi for um, backing us and, and um, coming out to support us because we uh, really appreciate the fact that we've got organizations like Barclays, Microlink, MyClearText that are willing to support inclusion and support the conversations that we're having with people that are doing great work in the field like yourself, Nancy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. You're wonderful. Oh, goodness me. Oh, that was great. Thanks. Thank you. Do you know, I want to play that video.